the Lord then said to Noah, Go into the ark, you and your whole family, because I have found you righteous in this generation. If we are thrown into the blazing furnace, the God we serve is able to deliver us from it. Moses answered the people, Do not be afraid. Stand firm and you will see the deliverance the Lord will bring you today. The Lord who rescued me from the paw of the lion will rescue me from the hand of this Philistine. For the Lord sees not as man sees. Man looks on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks on the heart. Hey, Living Stones. It's good to be here today. Andy introduced me earlier. My name is Josh, uh, and it's just such a gift to be with you. Um, for those that maybe are here for the first time, haven't been here in a while, uh, Living Stones is diving into this series called Greatest Hits This Summer. Um devoted to some of the greatest stories in the Old Testament, which is the first half of the Bible. Now, when it comes to music, I love a Greatest Hits record. Uh, And for those in the room before the time of online music streaming services like Spotify or Apple Music, you might remember compilation albums. Um, which were like the greatest hits of the greatest hits. Um, Like maybe this one, I I don't know if anyone remembers Sounds of the 70s. Check this out. Presenting Sounds of the 70s. All your favorite 70s hits in one fantastic collection. We had joy, we had fun, we had seasons in the sun. The feel really, really so you can, you can fade out. I thought I sent you the cut one, but that was that was great. You know, the the you know, that would have been two minutes, and everyone who knows those songs would have been rocking with me. I need you to understand that that commercial was one that played all the time in Minot, North Dakota growing up. And me and my buddies had the entire commercial memorized, all two minutes. And when we would hear the songs on the radio, we were only as good as like the four second clip that was on that on that commercial, right? I had no idea that the song even went any further than Hooked on a Feeling, right? Like I was like... I didn't know, you know, that you were that they were high on believing that someone was in love with them. I just knew that they were hooked on a feeling. Didn't know what it was. Right? So we <laughs> we we loved compilation records. And when I think of music, one of the things that makes music music is the noise of the music. And noise is a real issue for many of us, right? Um whether it be sirens or chomping noises from chewing, someone chewing right near your ear. Some of you are already getting uncomfortable as I say that, you know, or clicking of a pen or maybe a phlegmy clearing of the throat. Uh, 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 maybe nails on the chalkboard. Uh, I could go on and on, right? Um, those things are noise. But then, sorry, not so phlegmy. Um, That'll be later. Uh, But there's noise. And then there's noise, right? Tyrone Holmes wants to find noise as anything that interferes with the accurate transmission between a sender and a receiver. More broadly, it is anything that interferes with our ability to build powerful connections in our lives. You want to throw that up on the screen? Back there? It's in there. It should be in there. Yeah, there we go. So anything that interferes with the accurate transmission between a sender and a receiver more broadly, it is anything that interferes with our ability to build powerful connections in our lives. So if we were to look at what could be defined in our lives as noise, 
what would some of those things be? What would the impact of those things be, both in the short term and in the long term? If the Old Testament had a greatest hits record, one of the most incredible tracks on the album would feature Elijah, without a doubt. Um, Elijah was one of the most amazing figures in all the Bible. He was a prophet. He came on the scene in 1 Kings chapter 17. And his time as a prophet didn't last long. Biblical scholars kind of think it was about 35 years. And he lived in the power of God and experienced some beautiful displays of God's glory. He experienced provision through God's provision through a widow who only had a handful of flour and a little olive oil in a jar, and God provided over and over so the oil and the flour never ran out. He saw God raise a child from the dead right in front of him. He stood defiant in front of 450 prophets of Baal and 400 prophets of Asherah, and saw fire fall from heaven and consume an animal, an altar, made of like giant stones, right? And a trench full of water surrounding the altar, all of it consumed by this fire. Elijah had reason upon reason to trust in God, to believe him for more, to not get gripped with fear, but to live in the power that he so incredibly experienced in his life. Yet after all of these miracles and acts of God, Elijah finds himself in an interesting spot. See, the evil king and queen of Israel, Ahab and Jezebel, aren't pleased that all their prophets of Baal had been slaughtered. And in 1 Kings 19.2, it tells us, So Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah to say, May the gods deal with me, be it ever so severely, if by this time tomorrow I do not make it, I do not make your life like that of one of them, meaning the prophets of Baal who had been murdered. And the next words written by the author of 1 Kings, it could have been Ezra, it could have been Jeremiah or Ezekiel, were the following. Elijah was afraid and ran for his life. Now, may I remind all of us that in this moment he had just come off the greatest moment of his life where he had experienced the greatest display of God's glory in his life up to that point. And here he found himself running for his life. The passage then lays out when he came to Beersheba in Judah, he left his servant there while he himself went on a day's journey into the wilderness. He came to a broom brush, sat down under it and prayed that he might die. I have had enough, Lord, he said. Take my life. I'm no better than my ancestors. Then he lay down under the bush and fell asleep. Now, I want to just stop here for a second. Okay, so the man that God took in bodily form, okay, Elijah was one of two people in the Bible never to die. Okay, the man who God took in bodily form, and here he is asking that God would take his life after moments that he experienced that are nothing close to what any of most of us, at least, I don't know if you've been seeing fire fall from heaven recently, consuming altars. And you know, I, I don't, that's not my story, but he's a giant of the faith, but he's living in fear, weariness, depression, insecurity, worry, hopelessness. And I don't know about you, but Any of these things sound like things that maybe you feel or experience on a monthly or a weekly or a daily or an hourly basis? I need you to understand, in this moment, may you feel and may you see that you are not alone. Whatever it is, that you're experiencing many walking alongside you in life, whether they're telling you it or not, or those who have gone before you have or are experiencing what you are walking through. So Elijah's sleeping, and the text shows us that all at once an angel touched him and said, get up and eat. So he looked around, and there by his head was some baked some bread baked over hot coals and a jar of water. He ate and drank and then lay down again. 
The angel of the Lord came back a second time and touched him and said, get up and eat for the journey is too much for you. You're going to find out about that in a second. Get up and eat for the journey is too much for you. So he got up and he ate and drank. All right, get ready for this. Strengthened by that food, he traveled 40 days and 40 nights until he reached Horeb, the mountain of God. There he went into a cave and spent the night. So Elijah is fed twice by an angel. There's something very special about that food that he was fed. And in that, right, we see that God meets us with what we need. God meets us with what we need. See, he met Elijah with what he needed. He needed rest. He needed food. And the food that the angel gave him was food in the Hebrew language, okay? This, this food was never mentioned anywhere else in the Old Testament. The words that were used to describe that food, there are two different words. You want to throw those up? You got, I'm guessing that this is how do you pronounce it. Those of you with Hebrew language expertise, you can correct me afterwards. But I think it's you got and it's hakila. Okay, these are the two words described. One for the first time he was fed, the other one for the second time he was fed. And neither of these words are used anywhere else in the Old Testament. Now, for me, it's interesting Makes me go, because here's the thing, right? Like, he he gets this food, and then, then he takes a 40-day and 40-night hike, right? And over those 40 days and 40 nights, you want to throw the map up? He, he walks 420 kilometers, which is about 260 miles. Sustained by that food. It's incredible. And isn't it interesting, right, that Elijah thought he knew what he needed and what he should ask God for, which was death, and God met him with what he needed. And I don't know if you can think of a time in your life where maybe this has happened or maybe you're in a place right now where you need this. And instead of God meeting you with what you thought you needed, He decided to give you, in his grace, what you truly needed. See, Elijah asked for the opposite of what God was. And God is. And God was like, I got you, Elijah. So God meets us with what we need, right? And so after this 260-mile jaunt that he went on, he finds himself at Horeb. The mountain of God. Now, most of us maybe haven't heard of Horeb before, but maybe you've heard of Mount Sinai. And Mount Sinai and Horeb are the exact same place. It's the place where Moses experienced the burning bush and, crazy enough, the place where Moses got the Ten Commandments. It was a super important place to the Jewish people in their history, and here Elijah finds himself. And in this moment, the text shows us that God met Elijah with an invitation. This is what the word says. It says, And the word of the Lord came to him, What are you doing here, Elijah? And he replied, I have been very zealous for the Lord God Almighty. The Israelites have rejected your covenant, torn down your altars, and put your prophets to death with the sword. I am the only one left, and now they are trying to kill me too. The Lord said, go out and stand on the mountain in the presence of the Lord, for the Lord is about to pass by. Isn't it so sweet that God asks Elijah such a simple question? What are you doing here, Elijah? One of my mentors from afar spoke on this topic, and he said, I just hope that God never asks me that question. What are you doing here? Because it would be very obvious that I was definitely in the wrong place. But God, in his grace, asked Elijah the question, what are you doing here? And then he gave Elijah a listening ear as Elijah shared his plight with God, right? Of course, God knew what was going on, but God in his, is he so sweet about giving us safe space to process what's going on in our lives. 
And then we can see that God gave Elijah an invitation, go out and stand on the mountain in the presence of the Lord, for the Lord is about to pass by. Okay, Elijah's a mess. He's distraught. He's scared. And yet the goodness of God is on display as he meets Elijah with an invitation, stand. I'm going to pass by. My friends, no matter what it is that we're facing, no matter how big of an issue is standing in front of us, God meets us with an invitation. And this invitation is to his presence, like he did with Elijah in that moment. Verse 11 says, The Lord said, Go out and stand on the mountain in the presence of the Lord, for the Lord is about to pass by. Then a great and powerful wind tore the mountains apart and shattered the rocks before the Lord, but the Lord was not in the wind. And the wind, after the wind, there was an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake came a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire came a gentle whisper. When Elijah heard it, he pulled his cloak over his face and went out and stood at the mouth of the cave. The invitation that the Lord gave Elijah was an invitation to his presence. He was going to pass by, and even as the events began to unfold, a wind powerful enough to tear the mountains apart and shatter rocks came before the Lord, and it did nothing to him. Then an earthquake came, and then a fire, and none of those things brought Elijah out of the cave. But then a gentle whisper. And in that moment, Elijah knew that he was there. He stepped to the mouth of the cave, and in pulling his cloak over his face, he acknowledged that the Lord was there. The Hebrew word that is used in this scripture where we see Lord is the word Yahweh, which, in, which is his Hebrew name, the name that they gave him, the name that the Jewish people gave him. And the word, that word Lord, just in this passage alone, is used 11 times. And that word was so important, such an important part of what was about to happen. And I'd love for you, just for a few moments, to listen to the perspective of Jews and ancient Jews and what that word Yahweh meant to them. Check out this video. One of these scientists that I was listening to several years ago also happened to be a Jewish rabbi. And in his talk, he said, you know, you Christians never really understood the meaning of the third commandment, to not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. To speak something in vain is to speak it with emptiness, with futility. It's a waste of time. He said the meaning of the commandment as it was understood for centuries in Judaism, was don't even speak the name. Don't ever in your lifetime pronounce the sacred name Yahweh. Never. And he said this gave us, at the very beginnings of the Judeo-Christian tradition, a cosmic humility about God, That once you think you've got God in your pocket, that you understand the great mystery, uh, er religion always becomes, he said, arrogant and idolatrous, where we love our explanations of God more than actually falling in love with God, where God refuses to ever be an object of the intellect, but is only known by those who enter into love and surrender. Secondly, he said, and probably a lot of you know this, that when you write Hebrew, you actually just write the consonants. And what it means to be an educated Jew is to have memorized the appropriate vowels and to know how to fill in the appropriate vowels in the appropriate places. I knew that from my short Hebrew class. But the third part is what I most want to leave with you tonight. He said, did you know that the consonants used in the spelling of the sacred name, Yahweh, are in fact the only consonants that, if correctly pronounced, do not allow you 
to use your tongue or close your lips. In fact, we know that the pronouncing of the sacred name was an attempt to imitate and replicate breath, that it was inhalation and exhalation. And then he began to do it into the microphone. And in a few minutes, tears started being audible in the room, in a room of PhDs. So I want to invite us in this moment into that same thing. And as I was prepping for this message, I stepped into this breathing of the name. And to be honest with you, I wasn't ready for it. I was overwhelmed as I repeated it over and over, breathing in, breathing out, stepping into his invitation of connection even through the simple act of breathing. And so if you're comfortable, I want to encourage you to close your eyes and to breathe in and out the name that gives us breath. And I encourage you as you're doing that to think about how he is inviting you to himself. And so I will start. When that gentle whisper came to Elijah, I can only speculate. But could it have been just him whispering his name? Yahweh was meeting Elijah with an invitation to experience the real him, the real Yahweh. Yahweh met Elijah with what he needed. He met Elijah with an invitation. And even though Elijah was very much struggle blessing in this moment, Yahweh still saw fit to meet him with a mission. In verse 15, it says, The Lord said to him, Go back the way you came and go to the desert of Damascus. When you get there, anoint Hazael king over Aram. Also anoint Jehu son of Nimshi king over Israel. And anoint Elisha son of Shaphat from Abel Mahola to succeed you as prophet. Jehu will put to death any who escaped the sword of Hazael, and Elisha will put to death any who escaped the sword of Jehu. And I reserve 7,000 in Israel, all whose knees have not bowed down to Baal and whose mouths have not kissed him. Yahweh was so clear in this that he was not finished with Elijah. And even though Elijah wanted to be finished, 
There was so much left to do. Anoint kings, anoint his successor, and even know that God had 7,000 that had not chosen to worship Baal. He was not alone. If we go back in that passage where Elijah is, is talking in verse 10, and he's like, I have been very zealous for the Lord Almighty. The Israelites have rejected your covenant, torn down your altars, put your prophets to death with the sword, and I am the only one that left, and now they're trying to kill me too. He wasn't the only one. Where... 7,000. He was not alone. So in verse 19, it says, So Elijah went from there and found Elisha, son of Shabbat. Now, again, let's go back. Mr. Paralyzed Elijah just gets up and goes? The one who ran, the one who hid in the cave, he just gets up and goes? No arguing, no debating. There is something that happened. He heard the mission that Yahweh had for him. And guys, I think that's how it is in our lives. It has to be. It's so easy to get paralyzed with fear, with what we fear, what we feel insecure about, what we see in front of us. But when Yahweh comes with his gentle whisper and he reminds us of who he is, mm. he calls us into a plan and a purpose. When we know that he's in it, there's a confidence that comes with that. So he meets us with what we need. He meets us with an invitation. And he meets us with a purpose. Remember the definition of noise from earlier? Anything that interferes with the accurate transmission between a sender and a receiver. More broadly, it is anything that interferes with our ability to build powerful connections in our lives. So what is it? Like, what noise do you think is keeping you from hearing the gentle whisper? What noise is keeping you from building powerful connections specifically with God, but even with others in your life. There's this noise, there's this blockage, there's this thing that maybe you know what it is and maybe you don't know what it is. Maybe you're not willing to acknowledge what it is. There's something. Maybe even something specifically with God, right? What noise is keeping you remembering who God is in the face of what you're walking through. I know too often when I'm experiencing stress or distress or fear or worry or anger, my reactionary response is triggered in me before I ever come to the place breathing through. See, I wonder what our lives, yours and mine, whew, mine, would look like day in and day out if we became people who were committed to eliminating the noise, to seeking with all that we are, right, to build a connection with and moved towards being the people who meet with not just to check it off a box to live in the presence and the power the one who does all he can to meet us 
what we need. With an invitation, with a purpose, with a whisper. Jesus, thank you. Phew. Thank you. Thank you that you see beyond our immediate selves and thank you that you see beyond the noise that is separating us like it did Elijah from really being able to hear your voice, your heart, your provision, your invitation, your mission. Thank you that you're sitting right here with us right now in this moment. Thank you for your promise that wherever two or three are gathered, you're with them. And I, I just thank you for that. If we can hang on to that. Help us. Position ourselves. The edge of our cave. For you to pass by. And we invite that right now. We invite you to pass by and we invite you to speak your name to us. Whether we're ready for it or not, we just know that we need it, Lord. Please, in a way that only you can. If we accept your invitation, now we're just like, please, Lord, please, out way, just show. That we might hear you. We might hear your voice. We might hear your whisper. Love you. Believe all these things in your name.